Shalom and welcome. This is Kieran Hanna from Jerusalem and today we're going to be taking a special look at the lights of Hanukkah. Now you can see a little Hanukkah here behind me and which I've lit already but the flames will aren't showing up too well but nevertheless we will begin. So welcome, Shalom and the central theme of Hanukkah, the wonderful, special festival of Hanukkah, is light. Now in Hebrew, the word for light is or. And interestingly, the 25th word of the Hebrew scriptures is or, light. And God said, let there be light. Um, now, Light is the central, the element actually, that connects all the biblical festivals. Um, and of course it's reflected every week on Shabbat and Havdalah, where we see the candles um, reflecting this beautiful light, which we're going to be looking at tonight or today. Maybe where you are, it's still morning. <laughs> um, now, Interestingly, we light the most candles, the most lights at Hanukkah, which is during the darkest month in Israel. It's the darkest time of the year. Therefore, it's very fitting that we're lighting these lights. Now, how many candles are lit? We, we are not counting the shamash, which we'll be looking at. There are 36 candles that are lit during Hanukkah, which is, that's a lot of candles lit during the eight nights. Now it's an interesting number too because uh, the number 18 is Chai in Hebrew and Chai is uh, life. So it's, as we light these little candles it's bringing life and light into our homes where we're lighting them. And 36 is double 18, 18 times 2. So it's a uh, double life, as it were. So what, the, what I see the, the lights of the candles doing, it's, it's uniting our internal spiritual life with our external physical life. That, that it's making us aware that, that we um, need to be conscious of these, uh, the, the unity and harmony that bringing these two together can bring, that, that our, our spirits are in tune, our bodies are in tune with our spirits and vice versa. So I think those little 36 lights will help us do that if we are thinking about it and aware of it during this Hanukkah. Now the festival lights beginning with Shabbat are meant to reflect a unique light. They're not just to light up the room, uh, and we don't read by the lights of the, the Hanukkah or the Shabbat candles because they're not meant to be just for a, a practical, everyday, natural light. They are meant to reflect a very unique light. And we'll see how they're connected with the unique light of God's presence and His creative, illuminating Word that He spoke in uh, he, he spoke in the beginning of creation in Genesis. He spoke everything into being by this creative, illuminating light of his word. Um, now, this mysterious light that's not the natural light is called in Hebrew Or Haganus. What does that mean? It means it's a supernatural and now concealed light. It's a light that is not... Uh, visible to us in the natural world any longer and interestingly this was the light that was shining of God's presence in the Garden of Eden so when Adam and Eve were walking with him they were just reflecting um, the light of this glory of the presence of God and um, in rabbinic literature interestingly enough it's called Or HaMashiach they see it as the anointed light, the light of Messiah, which is beautiful. So it's not the natural light of the sun and the moon and the stars, 
Why? Because those were only created on the fourth day and this light was there before the sun, moon and stars were created. So that's why we don't use the Hanukkah candles or the Shabbat candles uh, for natural things because they are meant to reflect, be a reminder and a reflection as we gaze at them and their beautiful little flames of this now hidden concealed light that will one day be revealed again. Now um, once the, the candle, the we get the Hanukkah ready on Hanukkah, traditionally it's placed near a window or even these days you can see many here in Jerusalem and all over Israel they've been placed outside the door at the entrance to the house. Now why is this? It's so that um, the point is not only to enjoy them ourselves in, in the home but to be able to share the light with those who are still outside. Now some of you may have heard of Rabbi Shlomo Kalabach I'm sure you, you might even sing some of his wonderful melodies um, in your congregations. But he said, by putting the lights in the window or by the door, it's as if we are saying, all of you who are walking in the streets of the world in darkness, please come back to Yerushalayim, the holy city of God. Come back to what is holy and beautiful back to the light of his word and his kingdom. Then our feet can all dance in joy and unity. Now, he, he, of course he played and he loved dancing. You have to dance to his music. But he was saying that the Hanukkah lights are placed outside the door to call all those who are still walking in darkness and say, come, there is a beautiful light of truth. There's a light of God's presence that you can come and enjoy. And where better than in the holy city of Jerusalem? Um, now, I love that idea of the unity that these lights bring. Because if you look, uh, for example, at the Shabbat candles, well, I've lit the two candles behind, but I'm not sure if you can see the light too clearly. No, <laughs> um, there's a lot of light, but uh, the two candles are separate. And yet, once they are lit, they are united. And what unites them? The light. So, in this beautiful light, the light of God, the light of His presence, the light of His truth and His word, we can all be united as one, which I think is rather special. And Shlomo Kalabach added, It is clear to me on Hanukkah that all the hatred in the world is because they never tasted the light of the Holy of Holies. So people who, who don't know that love and that light of God, they, they get, can be affected by the, the, the evil and the sadness in the world and it stokes that hatred in hearts which should never be there if they know the, the, the holiness and the light of, of the presence of God. And if we think about it, this was the, mis the mission of Yeshua, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. He was the Word incarnate, as we read in, in John, the Word, that very Word of light that first was uh, evident at creation. He was that Word incarnate, made flesh, and God sent him to be the light of the world, the light to the world, to illuminate the world with, his, uh, with the light of his truth. Now, the apostle to the nations, Paul, tells us in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, For God, who said, Light shall shine in the darkness, is the one who has shone in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Messiah. Which is, I love that verse because it says, God was the one who said, light shall shine in the darkness. He spoke the word of light into the darkness. He created light by his word and he shone in our hearts so that the knowledge of the glory of God could be seen in the face of Messiah. Now, 
So if we want to become uh, into deeper knowledge of our Father who is in heaven, Avinu Shabashamayim, look into the face of Messiah, is what Paul was saying. Now, Yeshua always looked to the Father. He was saying, um, you know, I can do nothing except what I see the Father doing. And certainly his face, because he was continually looking towards the Father, his face must have clearly reflected the light and beauty and holiness of the Father. So, well, we know because the presence uh, of God is revealed and reflected in his word. So we can today, when we read the word, we, we, we get that sense of his presence and light and truth. And um, so through Jesus, through Yeshua the Messiah, there was a wonderful breakthrough of this light in the form of um, universal redemption. So Israel already knew the word, knew the presence of God, but through Yeshua, this was able to break through to the four corners of the earth as we, are, as we know. But now what is happening today that we can see in our own time, that light that went out of the knowledge of God, of his word of truth, is now coming back to its source. And where is the source? It's in, it's back in his land, back in his city, back in um, the place where it all began. So the light is coming back because as we know, the prophet Isaiah said, because in the end times, the light of God's glory and truth will go forth from Jerusalem, from the land of Israel once again. Why? In preparation for the return of Messiah, the time when Yeshua will return as Mashiach ben David. He's not going to be returning anywhere else in the world, but back to his city, Jerusalem. So it's as if the light has to come back. The light has to be shining forth again in preparation for the time when he will return as Mashiach ben David, Messiah, the son of David, to reign and rule from Jerusalem as the king of kings, which is a wonderful thought. Now, there is an important connection actually with Hanukkah and the land of Israel. Number one, um, it's the only festival that happened here. The reason for the festival happened here in the land in Jerusalem. I mean, think about it. What, where was Passover, Pesach? Where did that happen? The exodus from Egypt. So the, 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 the reason for uh, Passover happened in Egypt. Uh, what about Shavuot? That happened at Mount Sinai also outside of the land. Uh, what about um, the Feast of Tabernacles? Where was the Feast of Tabernacles? First, what was the, the root of that? In the wilderness, the, the Sukkot or the tabernacles that the Israelites dwelt in, in the wilderness. And Purim happened in Persia. So, but Hanukkah took place, the, the miracles happened here in Israel because think of it at the heart of the story of Hanukkah is the rededication of the temple which was uh, polluted and um, desecrated by Antiochus the uh, head of the um, Greco-Roman uh, army that was occupying the land then at the time and um, the Hebrew word Hanukkah actually means dedication. So that is at the heart of it, that this temple that was desecrated was once again rededicated by the Maccabees. Now, who was the, the Maccabees? We will be getting to that story, but let me just first say that, um, getting back to that connection with Jerusalem, that, um, that this is... The, the, the whole purpose of the, the, the battle of the Maccabees was to gain control again of the temple and be able to light the light of God's presence. Now, what was that light? What was that light that symbolized his presence and his word? It was, of course, the beautiful golden menorah. 
and um, that the high priest used to light that menorah morning and evening and it was to never ever go out to show that the presence of God was there um, all the time and that of course had been extinguished and now the Maccabees were going to relight it so wherever we light the lights of Hanukkah whether it's here in Israel whether it's wherever you are it's that light that unites us all as if we are now priests in the temple rededicating our homes ourselves uh, to the glory and the presence of God so as we light we all united in spirit by that light that unites and as if we're all standing together in the holy place in Jerusalem. You know, uh, in Psalm 27, now that's usually a psalm that we read at Elul, during the month of Elul, but it also ties in beautifully with Hanukkah. Thank you, I see you all sharing the love. <laughs> that's so beautiful. I'm, I'm hoping that this light will go from Jerusalem and unite us all um, in in its beautiful light. And I see Barbara mentions that the 36 lights that we light are also for the 36 righteous, the Lamed Vavniks they're called in uh, Hebrew. They, that, that, um, they say that they're, they're always 36 righteous. There's a remnant of, of tzaddikim, of, of righteous, that are not always visible to the eye, but that they are carrying this light forward. Thanks for that reminder, Barbara. Um, so in Psalm 27, David proclaims first, he says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. So there we see the theme of light coming in. And he says, whom shall I fear? If we are standing in his light, if we, are, we, are, we are, have his light in our hearts, we need fear no one or nothing. Then in verse 4, he says, one, this is one of my favorite verses as well. He says, one thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So there, in that, um, that, that David just longs and desires to always be in the place of God's presence in the temple, why? To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. So there he's connecting the eyes of gazing at this beauty. And that's what I mentioned about we, we, all we do with these beautiful lights of Hanukkah and of Shabbat and the festivals is just to gaze upon them and remember the beauty of the Lord, of his presence um, in that hidden, now concealed light that will one day be revealed and we'll be able to glory in its light once again so um, this uh, light that us, we were talking about that represented this organus this this supernatural light was the menorah and um, it's called also the ner tamid or eternal flame and and you always see one in a synagogue to keep that idea of the menorah and the special concealed light of his presence burning. Um, now just, all right, let's go into the story, back to the story of the Maccabees quickly, because there were two miracles, as we know. There was the miracle of the military victory um, of this small group led by a family of priests, Matatiau and his son Judah and his brothers, and they fought rose up and, and fought against this mighty Greco-Roman army that were in Israel. Um, and yet they won. They overcame and they won and they were um, uh, under the, this Greco-Roman army. The, the Jews were not allowed. They were forbidden to uh, celebrate or honor the new moon and the Sabbaths. And they were not allowed to circumcise their children. There are horrific stories of, of mothers who, who um, were killed for circumcising their children and the babies were, were hanged and killed. Um, but they did it because the circumcision was a sign of the covenant with God. And, um, and then, of course, this Greek idol that was set up in the temple, they were made to bow to the temple, I mean, to this idol. And this priestly family said, no, we are trusting God to be able to restore and rededicate the temple 
which is what they did. So the first miracle was the military victory that God allowed them to have. Now, of course, you can find more of the story and more about Hanukkah and how to celebrate uh, on the His Israel website under festivals. You can find Hanukkah if you want to look into it a little more deeply. But um, I just want to mention the second miracle, which we all know, was um, that when they went in to clean out the temple again, they only found the one little jar or cruise of and of uh, special oil, the holy oil for the menorah. And, um, but it was, the problem was, it was only enough for one day. So they said, what do we do? And they said, no, we cannot wait any longer. We must just in faith, light the light of God's presence to bring his presence back into his house, his holy temple. So they, filled up the menorah and they lit the lights and of course the miracle was that it uh, burnt for another seven um, days a week that was taken to prepare this pure olive oil that was needed and uh, that the miracle was that that was not a um, natural oil it wasn't the fire that burnt with that oil wasn't natural because um, it's only the supernatural or ganus that that lights and burns and causes the flame but it doesn't burn up it doesn't consume anything now where do we actually see the first mention of this in the bible was at the burning bush when moses stopped and he saw this this uh, miraculous sight of this bush that was a flame it was burning but it wasn't being consumed and that was the difference between the natural fire that burns and the supernatural flame or organus that showed God's presence. And that was the light that Moses saw burning. And he knew it was the presence of God. And God then, of course, spoke to him and called him to go back to Egypt and uh, carry the word of his promise of deliverance to his people, the Israelites, that they would be delivered from Egypt. Um, so it's just, a, it's just a wonderful light if we think about that. And that's what the lights of Hanukkah are supposed to represent to us. Now, if we look at the Hanukkah, I actually have one here. It's just a little antique one, which is more in the Yemenite or Persian style. Um, I don't know if you can see it. Um, it's one that has the little oil lamps um, that were used. And I just want to point out the shamash, which is always, this is the light, that it, the candle that is first lit and is used to light the other lights. So the shamash is always set apart and raised up. And that's also a beautiful uh, little symbol of the light of Yeshua, who his light, by his light, he can light all the other little lights um, of our hearts as well. And... Um, so here, this is actually, you can see one that was used for oil. You could put, it was like all in the form of little lamps that were used for oil. It's got a little hook on the back, which shows that, that these, whoever had this one, whether it was, it looks like maybe Yemenite or Persian, that this was, could be put up on a hook outside the door as well, which is rather lovely. And you can see, I, I like it because you can see the Star of David, like the, the star that's rising and these are all the little rays. It's a lovely design. Um, but the one behind me is a very modern one that we got here in Israel. Um, but you can see the center, the shamash is also raised up. And that's always lit first and then used to light the other lights. It's raised up and set apart. Um, now... Uh, I want to just mention again, in, uh, sh there's a book called The Soul of Hanukkah, which is uh, compiled by Rabbi Shlomo Katz, but it's all the teachings of Rabbi Shlomo Kalabach. And he shares about how uh, the festival of Hanukkah is a healing for the eyes. We've been talking about how we're gazing upon this light, this light of the presence of God. That, that he says it's actually when we do look at the lights of Hanukkah, it's bringing healing to our eyes. 
Now, how come he says it can, it can even heal how we see God, how we look at things. When we look at things, even what's happening in our own lives, do we see them from God's perspective, from the eternal perspective, that, that uh, we don't need to get so concerned and worried about what's happening because we know, no, God is working everything out according to his eternal perspective and also in accord with his word. So if we think of the light of his word and the light of his presence, and if we apply that light and allow it to shine on our lives and give us his perspective by seeing these things in his light, that will really bring a healing to the way that we see things. Think about how we see others. Are we allowing God to give us the ability to look at them and see them in the way that he sees them. Now, do you think God ever looks at anyone with hatred? Um, I mean, I, I, <laughs> it's difficult for me because I think of certain characters in history that you think, well, I don't know how anyone can look at them in love. It says a mother always looks at the, her child with eyes of love. But if you think of um, Hitler and Haman and people like that, you think, well, how could God even look at them and see them in, in a light of love? But, but his love is so, so greater than we can imagine. And the thing is that we remember that every single person is created. Every person is created in his likeness, his image and likeness. And so um, there's that little spark. And I think this is what that one little cruise of oil that the Maccabees found can remind us that no matter how dark things are, no matter how dark we even see, think another person is, that within them is that little tiny spark that's still there, that with the love of God, that, that can be caused to be lit again and, and, and bring life and light into the person's life. Um, you know, children love Hanukkah. When, whenever they're children and, and you, you light the Hanukkah, they just love lighting them and they just look at the lights and um, there's just a natural instinct. I think they, maybe their souls are still so pure and childlike that, that they see something in the light that, that sometimes adults miss. But um, they, they, just, they just love it and they, they just look at them and wonder somehow. And so as we gaze at them too, you know, I'm just praying this Hanukkah that, that we're able to look at them and wonder with the, that childlike faith and, and purity of spirit that we can see something in the light that will light the fire in our hearts again and, and give us uh, dreams, return our godly vision so that we will be able to see with this, the pure childlike Hanukkah eyes that... that um, it would just be wonderful. So may we really be able to see one another again in the light of God's love. And in that light, everyone looks beautiful. So um, I just trust that we will we'll be able to do that. Let him light that light of love in our hearts again this Hanukkah. You know, when a person is hurt and scared and, um, and scarred even, their spirits are scarred, if you just, if a person looks at them with this unconditional love and compassion without even saying anything, there's just something in that look um, that really helps heal the scars. There are just so many um, instances and testimonies of this that, that, that uh, we think, well, what can we do, Lord? But even just to allow his love to reach out and look at somebody who is hurting, that light can really bring healing to the person you know because this this love of god and his holiness shines such a, a, a light and a fire that warms and comforts it's a comforting thing that warms somebody without being a fire that will um, diminish or destroy or bring any kind of harm to that person and you know you know when you meet a truly holy person that um they're just shining with the light and the love of God. And you can feel safe in their presence and be free to be just who you are. You just uh, have that freedom 
um, and they're not out to judge you or chastise you or change or diminish you in any way. They just want that little flame in your spirit to just be lit with the, the love and the light of God. And because um, that, that's our longing that, that each one of us, each one that we come across will just be able to be and the, the, the wonderful, beautiful person that God created them to be and that they can then grow in that love and, and really shine for His glory so that that wonderful hidden concealed light will be able to shine forth and touch the lives of others. So God wants us all to be lovely shining lights for His name's sake because there's a, a, a good Jewish saying that says even a little light dispels a great darkness. So we might feel, well, what's my little light? What good can that do? But even that little light can dispel a great darkness. And I'll close with a verse, something Yeshua tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. He says, In the same way, as a lamp is raised on a stand, as the little lights of Hanukkah are lit in a Hanukkah, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And isn't that the desire of all our hearts, just to give glory to our Father in heaven? So uh, during the eight nights of Hanukkah, we will be recording um, a little something uh, like the lights and sharing something about this light that unites. And I'm praying that this light that goes forth, can you imagine when all these little Hanukkah lights are lit all over the world, that this light will go out and bring unity. It will unite us once again in the love and the light of God. So, hope to see you there. And uh, Hanukkah Sameah, have a happy, joyous, light-filled Hanukkah. Amen.